Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Me. Sorry. Yep. Oops. Hope you're doing well. Hope you got a snack. Uh, that's good. First of all, a word of thanks. Uh, you are sitting and listening to the second session, both of which have been led by people from Britain. Now, that is an act of incredible grace for you to do that, particularly here in the United States or in the southern part. I know that a number of years ago, you made every attempt to get rid of us. I understand that. Uh, I know the story, one if by land, two if by sea, all this stuff. And I know that you uh, displayed your frustration with having to pay tax without being represented. And you were right to be annoyed about that. I wouldn't have liked that either. Um, and you threw our tea in the cold waters of the Boston Harbor. Uh, and again, it seems rather a waste, uh, but uh, here in Texas, you're still spoiling tea by putting it in cold water. Uh, so <clears throat> so nothing, nothing's changed in this great world that we live in, and you're still being gracious listening to Brits talk about gospel priorities. So thank you for doing, uh, doing that. I want to follow on from some of the things that uh, Dennis so helpfully uh, led us in and to explain a bit about why I'm involved in this uh, ministry and to talk about some of the biblical realities that undergird the message because I'm committed to Rooftop, not just because I think it's a good idea, but because I think it's a God idea, uh, because I think it has biblical weight. Uh, and Dennis has hinted at that using some scriptures and uh, uh, and I have my Bible here. Uh, I, I bring this impressive, big, bulky red Bible to impress you. Uh, um, if um, I remember a professor in Dallas once years and years ago holding up his Bible, he was teaching a series on uh, the Acts of the Apostles, and he said, uh, he banged his Bible like this, and he said, if you can't get them with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, held his Bible up, hit them with the Acts. <laughs> right. And uh, there's a certain reality about that and a passion. Well, I hope you get hit by the Acts of the Apostles and the rest of this Holy Scripture as we talk uh, together. Uh, we're talking about the mission of Jesus, the God who seeks and saves, the God who's done that, actually, from the beginning of time. Uh, strictly speaking, it's not just Jesus who's involved in the seeking process. From the beginning of the Old Testament, the whole way God is defined for us in the pages of Scripture, through the narrative of the Older Covenant and the New Covenant, it is that there's a God who is active, not passive, actively engaged in planet Earth, wanting to see people drawn to himself by a recovery process. Because the Bible says, story starts with uh, an episode of rebellion and brokenness from which the world has never recovered. God has offered a recovery for it and women and men and whole groups of people have at times embraced that recovery package but nevertheless all that our world has is infected with this disease from the beginning of uh, human life to the current day. And in fact, it won't be eradicated totally until Jesus returns and the end of time comes and perfection is once again established in the world. We started in a garden in Eden and we're going to end in an eternal city. That's the journey of direction, but we're not there uh, we're not there yet. In a moment, I'm going to read uh, from the book of Genesis just to illustrate to you that this whole business of God seeking the lost and our joining him in seeking them uh, has its genesis, its beginning in the book of Genesis. Beginning and through the pages of scripture spells out the story of the divine love and compassion, wanting to see brokenness healed, sin forgiven, Guilt assuaged, life where there's death, and so on. All of that's God's priority for his world. And he wants us, as the followers of his son, to join him in that process, in some of the ways that Dennis outlined so helpfully. So the problem is that we're in a world in which brokenness is the default mode. Sometimes in science, this is called entropy. Things tend to decay and disorder. You know this in your yard. Think of your yard at home. If you want it to look beautiful, leave it alone for six months and it will increasingly get more beautiful. Is that true? No. 
it will increasingly be longer and weedier and all sorts of other things because creation has a tendency to decay and disorder. Human beings, if you want to uh, see your health decay, stop working on it. Stop cleaning your teeth, stop washing, stop feeding yourself properly, stop exercising. If you don't do all those things, your body will have a tendency to decay. And actually, as we get older, even if we do all those things, it still has this tendency to decay. And as I look out on you, I see a, a, a bunch of decaying uh, people uh, in front of me. And as you look at me, you see decay. I didn't look like this at 25 years of age. Uh, stuff's happening in my body unless I constantly take care of it. And the truth is that the older I get, the more care. I have to take because of this thing about decay. And this is not just true in the human body, it's true in institutions. And so, if you look at, for example, the sociology of institutional life, uh, this reality applies to political parties, businesses, religions, and, tragically, often the church. Uh, and it works in this way. So there are four stages of institutional decay. And I believe that the church is often at the fourth and most deadly phase of this institutional decay. Which is why what we need is this huge renewal of this movement of discipleship making to overcome this decay. And the four stages of institutional decay in sociological terms, well, and in analytical terms of our culture, uh, uh, are that societies, and Christianity is one of those in its religious format, uh, moves from a man to a movement to a monument to a museum. Those four stages of decay are the inevitable result of organizations that are not renewed. That happens to political parties. Uh, you, you see it uh, in the political decay in the United Kingdom, where our two main political parties are in a state of decay. No one quite knows what they're standing for. The political processes are becoming undone. And dare I say it, here in the United States, there's ample evidence that the historic two main parties of the Democrats and the Republicans are both of them, to some extent, in a state of decay. Please forgive me if you don't share that analysis. But if a country of 300 million people uh, can only throw up the two candidates who are going to be voted for as the next president of the United States, it seems to me there's a measure of societal decay in those two realities. Please forgive me. If you don't agree with that, that's fine. If you don't agree, it's not, it's not a problem. Uh, you can serve the Lord in your way and I'll serve him in his. So, <laughs> so here we are. Man, movement, monument, museum. And what happens is, is that uh, Jesus, the God-man, founded this thing called Christianity based, of course, in the Jewish heritage which he had in the Old Testament. And it became a movement as he created uh, 12 disciples to start with and then 120 in an upper room and then 3,000 converted on the day of Pentecost and then priests were converted and others and through great missionary outreach like Peter and Paul and others, many more came to know him. And a movement created that was so transforming that even though it was unheard of when Jesus was born in 4 or 5 BC, roughly around then in a manger in Bethlehem, when no one followed him, by three centuries later, an emperor called Constantine was declaring Christianity as the religion of the whole world in just 300 years. <laughs> some, some of us argue that that was the biggest mistake that ever happened to Christianity, making it acceptable. <laughs> Whereas actually, the gospel is very unacceptable and uh, is the rock of offense, actually, if we're to believe the pages of the scripture. So what happens is that the, the movement flourished and developed, and then it became a monument. And monuments are things, you know, you place it in a city center, a reminder of people who died in a war or, or a tribute to somebody. And, and buildings emerged. There were no church buildings in the early years of Christianity. And so a building starts to emerge. Uh, and, and people are drawn to the building to celebrate what the monument stands for. Uh, but the trouble is that over time, as people are not refreshed and renewed by the power of the Spirit, 
the monument becomes a museum. And many churches today are really museum-like because they invite people to come and look at some things that happened in the past, which is what a museum does. It says, this is your heritage, this used to happen, this is the way they did things. Isn't that interesting? Many churches aren't are really doing that sort of thing. This is the New Testament. Wasn't it exciting? People got healed. People got delivered from demonic powers. People got saved. What an exciting thing that used to be. <laughs> See, how that's, a, that's a museum. A, an example of stuff that happened. So the purpose of what Rooftop is about, in a sort of... Uh, principle terms, it is reminding us constantly that all organizations, political parties, businesses, religions, etc., and Christianity is not immune to this, need constant renewal if they're to fulfill their original purpose. And the original purpose of the Church of Jesus, as Dennis so eloquently has been describing to us, uh, is not to separate this sort of evangelism and discipleship thing, but is to make disciples as part of its core DNA, its very reason for existence. So here, in the book of Genesis, we read the start of the divine enterprise and it's this, Adam, Eve in the garden, a lot of fuss made about, uh, about you know, the apple and the tree and all that stuff. The problem, in, the problem in Genesis is not the apple and the tree, it's the pear on the ground, right? That's the problem. The people, right? The people. Because they, they say, we know better than God. By the way, if you want a definition of human sinfulness and why the world's in the broken state it is, there's the sentence. We know better than God. <laughs> so actually, we're going to seek a solution to our concern about eternal life and our solution to life in the garden. We're going to seek a solution which is not God's solution. And people are doing that now all the time. All the time. I'm... Part of my life is spent dealing with members of the judiciary, high court judges, politicians, sometimes prime ministers, certainly uh, people in significant political authority. And, and they're trying to seek solutions for society's brokenness. And I have the opportunity sometimes to say, there can't be a solution without dealing with the human condition. Right? There can't be one. And, and so for centuries, millennia, since this incident, people have been searching for solutions forgetting that God is searching for them. And, and the Muthis movement is about God already searching for us. So here we are in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3. Why don't we eat this fruit, the woman said. <laughs> One of the consequences of sin, by the way, is blame. <laughs> right? Have you noticed? <laughs> Why did you eat the fruit? <laughs> well, it was this woman you gave me. <laughs> Don't you love that? It's your fault, God, really. If you'd never given me this woman, and God says, well, I thought you quite liked her. He says, no, 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 this woman you gave me. And, and then the woman says, oh, it wasn't me. It was this snake. And so everybody blames everybody else. That's the nature, by the way. It's the offshoot of brokenness and sin. So they're in a mess, and they realize suddenly they are. So they're walking in the garden, as they often were. And they hid from the Lord, which is what society is doing constantly in its terrible decline into decay, which we see in the Western world. It's hiding from God and his solution because God's solution challenges human autonomy. It says to the human being, you can't solve your own problem. And that's deeply offensive to contemporary men and women because it challenges their own sense of, I am in charge, right? Have you noticed how society, particularly in the last 30 years, has become increasingly narcissistic and self-centered? You can have it any way you want. You are the Lord of your universe. By the way, this is a definition of a society in decay, not God on the throne, but me on the throne. And so if I'm on the throne and I matter more than anything else, all society is geared around my needs. I, I got an Uber here at lunchtime, and um, it, the, the Uber app's got more and more me-focused. Hello, Stephen. Makes me feel 
like the entire Uber world knows who I am. How nice of Uber to mention my name. And then he asked me to choose how I would like the car air conditioning to be. Air conditioning? Choose. And then he says, conversation. Do you, do you want to talk to the driver or not? And you're thinking, <laughs> it's really all about me. I, I felt, you feel like typing into the Uber app, but, but could, I could do with a latte. Can you bring one? <laughs> it's all about me. See? see, that is the primary human problem. Everybody searches for solutions until it gets so bloody, so desperate, so cruel, people cry out to God. You see the interview with a gang member from Haiti this morning. Haiti, I visited Port-au-Prince, did some filming there some years ago after an earthquake devastated the, the, the nation. But it, it's lawless in Haiti at the moment. And this gang member was interviewed this morning, gang leader, and surveying the wreckage, bullet-ridden bodies outside a judge's house. He looked straight in the camera and he said, only God can help us now. I wanted to shout down the camera, well, so Christians, say it now then. Let, let's get God involved in this huge mess, finally. Not, and that's just a big example of the normal human condition. So people are searching for other ways to live. But here is what the book of Genesis says to us. Uh, so the man, they're walking in the cool of the day and they hid themselves. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he said, well, I, I heard you and I was naked uh, and I was afraid. And so it goes on and everybody's complaining and, and so on uh, uh, about this whole process. But it's absolutely fascinating that it's God who seeks them out. If God hadn't gone to the garden... They would have been wandering around in their wickedness and sin and decay without any intervention because they're not looking for God. They're actually hiding from him. The very source of the solution they're hiding from. And so it's God seeking them out, walking. Where are you? Looking for them. And we believe in Rooftop that God is active in his world and we need eyes to see what he's doing so we can join him in doing it and drawing people into this relationship with his son. And through the pages of the Old Testament, we see this constant God intervening. The children of Israel worshipping for a while and then screwing up because entropy taking place. They're always default mode. It's build an idol, be sinful, do your own thing, ignore God. They're always defaulting back to that. And God's forever sending a prophet or a judge or a king. And in the end, if I may say this in a, a respectful way, God gets fed up with sending all these people and eventually says, enough, enough, enough. I'm going to send a son. And even then, they kill him. And God has to use the transformative effect of a willing victim to use the phrase C.S. Lewis uses in the Narnian material. He takes the willing victim and from that death extrapolates grace and peace and justice and freedom and brings people to God in ways that was not possible in any other way. But he's doing the intervention. He's seeking out. And so uh, this is the great passion of Rooftop, that God is seeking people and is active in Dallas, Texas and in the United States and in Great Britain and in the world. And we are to have our spiritual eyes opened. Remember that great story in 2 Kings 6 where Elijah's got this um, uh, young boy and he's about about to be killed by the invading army. And, uh, and uh, uh, the prophet says, greater is he that is with us than he that is against us, that sort of thing. And the young boy looks around and he just sees this massive army and he says, the old boy's got dementia. He's lost the plot completely. He's finished, right? Uh, and then the prophet says, Lord, open his eyes. And when he opens his eyes, he sees the hosts of heaven gathered around. Do you remember that story, some of you? It's just a remarkable story. The boy's eyes are open to see what God is actually doing. But until that prayer happens, he doesn't see it. And we've got church after church after church that doesn't see what God is doing. Because they're so internally focused, they don't see what God is doing out there. And one of the passages which inspired Dennis, actually, in the original hotel room in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, 
If Dennis goes on being successful, by the way, around the world, and we get to more and more countries, and he becomes, you know, incredibly famous for setting up the rooftop, they'll find this hotel room in Richmond, Virginia, and they'll turn it into a little shrine. You know, the Dennis Peathers shrine. There'll be, there'll be, you know, his his shoes somewhere, or a last breakfast or something, you know. Because people are always making a man from a movement into what? A monument, and then what? A museum, right? That's what we always keep on doing in the end. That's our default mechanism. So look out for that. I'll be dead and gone, fortunately. <laughs> the Dennis Peathers Shrine in, <laughs> in Richmond, Virginia. By the way, if there ever is one, I please don't go. <laughs> please don't go, because it will be a travesty of what this ministry is actually all about. But when he was there, God spoke to him through that passage in Acts of the Apostles, where Peter is on a rooftop at the home of Simon the Tanner, tanning uh, animal hide. Now, why was he on the roof? Well... It may have been a bit cooler on the roof, but also the tanning of hide is a very smelly business, and so the home stank, so it's cleaner air on the roof. So he can breathe a bit more deeply, falls asleep on the roof, has this vision, and God presents him with a sheet, and you know this story. Uh, but what's, what Dennis found incredibly releasing about this, this Acts of the Apostles epiphany for him was that Peter said, well, it's unclean, and God said, no, 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 no. Don't call it unclean if I've called it clean. Uh, because Jewish people were simply not engaged in talking to Gentiles. And how was this ministry, as again Dennis said, how is this ministry going to spread like wildfire? How is it going to happen if Jews don't even talk to Gentiles? And, and this is why, by the way, you may not have re reflected on this before, it's so crucial that the great command, go into all the world, make disciples, you know that passage at the end of Matthew, is in Matthew's gospel. Because, you know, the gospels are targeted at different groups. They're all inspired. John is very brief, uh, seven miracles, seven I am sayings, very selective material, written to help us find Jesus as the Son of God. Quite different from the other gospels. Mark's the shortest, briefest gospel. It has two little Greek words constantly used. Kaiuthus, it means and immediately. You can't read Mark's gospel and understand it without being on a jogging machine, right? And immediately Jesus did this. And immediately Jesus did that. I'm not making this up, by the way. Read Mark. And immediately Jesus did this. And immediately he did that. You, you feel like saying to Mark, Mark, take a chill pill. Calm down. We've, we've just had him do this. Let's just Let's just give Jesus lunch before he does something else. So Mark's the shortest gospel, probably the reminiscences of Peter. Or so one of the ancient fathers, Papias, uh, would have us believe. Uh, Luke writes to his mate, Theophilus, uh, a Gentile, explaining the Christian message to someone without a Jewish background. And Matthew is written with a Jewish background. And at the end of a Jewish gospel, for Jewish people is the emphasis, what comes Make disciples. It's the greatest challenge to cultural narrowness in the whole world because they're never going to make disciples because they don't even talk to Gentiles. And so Peter has this great revelation on the rooftop and, and suddenly he's looking on the world with fresh eyes. And so when there's a knock at the door and a hated Roman invading oppressor wants to see him he's ready to go which he wouldn't have been before this and so we, our prayer with rooftop is that we'll all have some kind of encounter in which the holy spirit so refreshes and renews our vision that we see the world with fresh eyes and those fresh eyes see what god is doing in the most unlikely places again uh, <laughs> He's made the point about, you know, when he was converted, he was converted on a train. And so he's a bit surprised when people said, we're hearing God's presence in the church. Because Dennis thought he'd left God on the train. And presumably the train was just getting into the station. So presumably God was at Liverpool Street Station. So people always say to me, well, you know, we come to church to meet God. I, I think, yeah, but what is, what's he doing when you've gone? Learning to play the drums? I mean, what's he doing? Well, the answer is, of course, he is when the people gather. Of course he is. 
But he's, this is his whole world. And we're praying to have our eyes open to see him at work. We need the Peter experience. To see him at work in the shops, in our workplaces, in the malls, in the schools, in the offices, and so on. Because unless we see him in those places, we won't be the disciples that we need to be. What's God doing in our communities? We need our eyes open to that. There's an absolutely fascinating verse. I'm, I'm sure you've read it, but I'm not sure you might have felt the import of it, the weight. It's in John 5, 19. Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. That's interesting. Jesus is the Son of God. I do what I see the Father doing. That's our job, by the way, to join Jesus in seeing what the Father's doing and joining in to do it. And to do that, we need a theology of the scattered church so that we don't think of it as a building or even as a people gathered. Uh, you've heard this before this, this afternoon. I'm repeating it uh, because it bears repetition. You see, uh, we've turned the functionality of this living, breathing body, the church, which is meant to be a verb, in other words, a doing word, not a noun, which is a static word. So if you think of the church as a noun, it's a building or a place or a gathering in one place. If you think of it as a verb, you think of it as the ecclesia, which means two uh, fairly straightforward Greek words, which, which mean to go up, to, to get out or, or, or to, to come together, but to move. The calling together or the calling out. Uh, in the same way that the second book of the Bible, Exodus, is from two Greek words, ex hodos, the way out. It's about movement. We're to be Exodus people, moving, not static. You see, even the church service breeds a kind of spectatoritis. I often think the church is a bit like watching an NFL football game. Uh, not as exciting as that, by the way. But um, it, it's like thousands of people in the stands who desperately need exercise watching a few people who desperately need rest. <laughs> I think that's what the church is like all the time. A few people do all the work and a lot of people sit and watch them do it. The spectatoritis. Sunday morning is a classic experience in many churches of a kind of passivity. Which, which the rooftop is really trying to come against, hopefully in a loving and in a New Testament way. Because, you know, they, they gather, not unlike this, you know, in rows. It's like a, it's like a kind of bus tour. So, so at 10.30 or 9 o'clock or 11, whenever the service starts, you know, up into the front of the church comes the, um, uh, comes the bus driver. And he says, okay, we're off on our weekly tour. So he'd say, look out this side, see a bit of John and Matthew, a bit of Isaiah, Jeremiah over here. And then halfway through, they collect up the bus fares. And, and at the end, everybody gets off and says, that was a nice tour, same time next week. And so it breathed, and we were all sitting in rows like we would be on a bus. I mean, it feels very passive. Over a century ago, an Archbishop of Canterbury William Temple said, the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of non-members. It's quite a profound thought which should lead us into this uh, activity, this, this action-orientated understanding of what discipleship is. It's m us being in love with Jesus and, uh, and talking about him and sharing him because we have been so helped and equipped and many of our churches aren't equipping us properly so we're scared and not very good at going out so that other people may also join in this great adventure. What they're actually joining in is from the Genesis beginning of divine creation when the fall happened with all its grotesque, grubby brokenness 
Since then, the divine heart has been working in humanity to repair it, to restore it, and to bring it back to completion in order that on that day, a beautiful, complete bride can be presented to his son. That's the biblical narrative. And so our job is to be helping people become disciples because we're helping them join this glorious divine initiative to change the world to bring beauty where there's brokenness and ugliness, to bring hope where there's hopelessness and desperation, to bring life where there's death. It's it's that amazing privilege of being co-conspirators with God, or as Paul says in Corinthians, co-workers together with God. And, And so we're committed to the concept of rooftop because we believe... It adequately reflects, not completely, of course. We're human still, and no human explanations totally explain divine activity. But because we believe it it flows in the good of the biblical material. And and it's a call to see entropy, entropy, entropy turned back. And it's a call to see uh, the, the... the museums closed and your monuments knocked down and the movement again restored so that women and men come to faith in Jesus Christ by putting their life at his disposal and doing what Jesus said to the first lot to do, follow me. And then to invite others to join us in the following process. Because if we make salvation a single one-off event in the past. I have become a Christian. I'm now becoming a better disciple. If, if that's what we define it as, no wonder we stop dead at sharing that love with others. We've seen the thing in the wrong way. I, I became a Christian in this context. My story, by the way, is very different from Dennis's and uh, uh, he, uh, he became Christian as a, uh, uh, an adult. Um, I grew up in a fabulous Christian home. My parents loved Jesus, went to church, were involved in the leadership. They, they, gen- My mother is 91 years of age and she still plays the piano every Sunday in church, right? She's, she's just the epitome of a godly woman. In heaven, she will be getting the mansion. I will be living in the outside bathroom somewhere away. But she, boy, and they shared the love of Jesus with me. And as a young boy, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted this. I didn't quite understand it for I'm very young and naive in some ways. And, you know, I was young at a time when the gangs of New York, Nicky Cruz, David Wilkerson, all this stuff, people getting saved from dramatic backgrounds. And I missed that. I wanted to have a dramatic story. I wanted to stand up. In, I was already starting... Uh, uh, my uh, class thing, if you read my class uh, report when I was seven years old, there's a lovely sentence in it which may have defined my life. It said, Stephen would learn a lot more in class if he would talk less. Um, Maybe that was prophetic over some of the things I'm going to spend my life doing. I wanted to say, I've given my, I've come from a background in which I had sex with a different woman every night, always got drunk, I was into drugs, and then converted at the age of seven. Right, which, which, you know, that's what I want. You know, I, who, who wants a boring story? Like, you knelt at your bedside as a seven-year-old, which is what happened to me. But the reality is, I then grew up in a churchmanship which taught me well. But there was no hint that part of this very lovely thing I'd discovered was that other people should be invited to join me in this loveliness in this beauty, in this treasure, which I had discovered, yes, in an earthen vessel, but a treasure. So we believe that um, the rooftop, uh, uh, at least in a small measure, uh, contains an important Old and New Testament theme about the searching God who is always working And our job is not to uh, uh, invent stuff particularly, but it's to see what Jesus is doing and join him in doing it. And as we are equipped ourselves to make, to be a disciple and to follow this Jesus and be so in love with him that we want others 
to join also and therefore be the church scattered, the, the church of Jesus, the, the church globally, made up of women and men who love this Jesus and who must share him. It's a kind of inner imperative, not just because it's right, but because they can't help but do it. And we see that, as we say, in, in many of the scriptures that I've tried to reference, uh, and we long to be those kinds of people, and we long to be those kinds of churches which may or may not have buildings, which may or may not have programs of one kind or another, fine, but which are determined to equip women and men for the task of being God's agents and ambassadors out there in the world where he's already working, but we're joining him as we travel to the office and we take the children to school and we go to the shop because he's already there and our job is to be there with him and to encourage our churches to be those kinds of churches. Let's pray for a moment, shall we? Lord Jesus, please uh, make me uh, an attractive presenter of your good news by the way I live and the things I say day by day. Please help me to be a disciple in the Bible sense and then someone who loves to help other people become disciples too. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in the room that in some way, as dramatic as Peter on the roof or quieter, they'll have an epiphany, an openness, a new experience of your heart because of what you're doing and the immense privilege of allowing us to join you in doing it. Help us, we pray. On our own, we can't do this. On our own, we can't drum up the energy. Uh, we need your help. Please help us. In Jesus' name.